Yiridum Marang. It's wonderful to have you as the inaugural interview for Yindya Mara. And I have Senator Lydia Thorpe, who is a Ganai Gandichamara Jawurong woman. And it's just a pleasure to have you today. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and I'm, I'm really honoured to uh, be the inaugural um, speaker. You know, I think this is a really important topic. So thank you. No, a pleasure. And you and I have something in common. And we mentioned that uh, you left school at 14 and I left school at 16, running out of the schoolyards. Um, isn't it amazing that now you're in this place and is this something now that you can make a huge difference with? Absolutely. Uh, I still have to pinch myself that I'm here. Uh, when I left school, it was, I just didn't, I didn't have a good experience at school. Uh, racism was really bad and it was just, I just used to get into fights and it just wasn't safe. So uh, to then go to work in a, uh, Aboriginal organisation from the age of 14. I learnt more uh, in that place than I did in my 14 years at school. Um, but in saying that, you know, I, I had to still go back uh, when I was older to, to get some more skills under my belt to, um, to do what I wanted to do in the future. And my dream was to become a CEO of an Aboriginal organisation, but I became a senator instead. <laughs> and how amazing is that? <laughs> so dreams, it's all about dreams, isn't it? And really giving Indigenous youth and young people um, an ability to fulfil their dreams. And is this something that we're really lacking in Australia today? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Our young people need to know um, their potential, they need to know their worth and they need to know that we can do anything, you know, and, and it is hard, like the struggle is hard and, um, you know, our families are struggling, but, you know, we, we can't give up. We've got to keep going because our ancestors rely on us to continue the, their legacy of speaking truth and, and keeping our mobs together. Uh, and continuing to call out the injustice that goes on in our communities. But also, um, you know, just having black voices out there makes us proud, but it also makes this country better. Like, you know, the people in this country don't even know what this country is about. And it's, they only start to realise when they hear from, from us, uh, they start to to come along and understand what we're about and what this country is about. So the more of our mob that stand up, the more this country can come along on what, on what we're really about as a nation. And um, I'm just, you know, inspired by our young people out there. Uh, and, you know, for those that are struggling, you know, reach out to your old, old people and, and reach out to um, people that you trust and have those yarns about, um, you know, some strategies on how to get through some of those tough times. And I, I always speak to my nan and my mum and my sisters and say, oh, you know, I'm having this terrible day. And uh, they always remind me that, no, you've got to continue what our old people have been doing, Lydia. So, you know, we, we love you, we support you, and you're doing the right thing. And the only other thing I want to say to that mm. is uh, my great nan, Nan Edna, you know, the one thing that she always, always said to me is never forget where you come from. And so in all the places that I've been, I always take that. Uh, message with me. It's very strong and the thing is too um, I, I don't think all of Australia appreciates how much we really depend on our identity and that's our identity isn't it really in all things in the environment where we come from who we're related to. Um, you've had some incredible activism in your family and your nan Alma mm -hmm. um, so all of those strengths plus you know who you are and representing on your shoulders are a, are a whole um, mob uh, who really are relying on you and many others uh, in the parliament to really speak their concerns. 
how how much of a burden is that but how much of an opportunity is that as well um it's quite a big burden uh because i'm also a mum and i'm also a grandmother uh and i'm also the oldest cousin of 90 so i have to play a leadership role in my own family as well as play a leadership role here and also be be answerable to my people out there uh, because I, I'm elevating our people's voice here and I want to be pulled up if I say the wrong thing. I want to be guided by our people because for far too long our voices have been denied in this place and this is a real opportunity. Um, you know, I used to watch my mum speak uh, in to public, you know, and do public speaking, and I just, I would just sit down in my chair and think, oh my god, I could never do that. Look how amazing she is. I could never get up in front of that many people and speak. And here I am. Here I am. And some of my elders say to me, you sound just like your mother. And I feel really honoured when they say that, because it's just through watching and learning that I've been able to come with a confidence and th that grassroots perspective on um, making our lives better, but also putting this nation on notice that we ain't going away and you better sit up and start listening to us. Mm. And do you think that that's really been exaggerated now that we've had COVID? We don't really know what normal is. So we're all looking for a new normal. How does Black Lives Matter really um, stress that things have changed? Uh, this might sound um, a bit weird, but I think mob will understand this. And that is, you know, when I feel down or when I feel like I'm losing the fight, I, I reach out to my ancestors and I know my, our ancestors are there all the time and I believe that our ancestors made this and ancestors around the world, First Peoples ancestors, made the world stop and think about what's important in our lives, our families, our land, our water, the things that everybody should care about. And I think COVID has really been an opportunity for people to reflect on those things that are really important to them. So I believe our ancestors have had a big role in this uh, in a way that's just made people reflect on what they're doing with their lives and how they're treating our land and our water. And a lot of people are starting to look at us for solutions and I think Black Lives Matter um, even though it took a, you know, a black man on the other side of the world to uh, elevate our voices, uh, I think that's certainly been instrumental in making people realise how important our voices are and our stories and our science and our knowledge on how to repair land and water and people. And climate change is a really big issue for many people across the world and youth as you've seen, eight year olds, 10 year olds, Greta Thunberg getting up and really speaking out those truths. How can we inspire our indigenous youth when there's so much deficit discourse around Australia? How can we inspire them to really participate in global climate change? Uh, we have to elevate, we have to move over, you know, and I. No disrespect, but, you know, some people have been in positions for too long and hold on to them and won't let them go. And I think that it's time to let go and move over and let our young people rise up. Don't go away altogether because our young people need that guidance and that mentoring and that support, which I think that they could play a really good role in, in supporting that. But... Our young people need a seat at the table and they need to be elevated and supported. Uh, and, you know, I for one will put my hand up and say to all our young people out there that, you know, if you want to yarn with me, 
then let's have that yarn because I know what it's like to struggle. I know what it's like to be told to sit down. It's not your time yet. Um, I know what it's like, but we have to push a bit um, to make sure our voices are heard and, and particularly young voices. So, you know, us older people need to allow that to happen. We can't wait until, you know, our young people get old to give them the space. They need the space now because our young people are our future. Well, I think we try to encourage a lot of Indigenous um, youth and you know, secondary students and primary students to imagine themselves as being educated, but also being reminded, as you've said, of a cultural education. So how can that happen today when there's just so much emphasis on getting a degree, going to university, um, getting a, an engineering degree or going to law school? How can we actually then say, don't forget who you are? I think the best degree that you can ever get, and that's the degree I have, and that's a degree in life. Um, that's a degree in our life experience. Because we can read it in a book, we can go to university and let white followers tell us how it's meant to be, but only we know what it's like to live in this country. And only we should be able to talk about that. So, um, I really struggled. I, I do have a degree now um, and I struggled through that. It wasn't easy and I needed all the help I could possibly get because, you know, I find it hard to read a book. Um, and I always have because I left school at such a young age. I didn't know how to write an essay and I still don't know how to write an essay. I have people that do that for me now. Um, I just think that um, don't be locked in to the white man's way of education because the best education you can ever get is from your old people and from your land and everything that belongs to the land. That's the best education you can get. And if you can articulate that through your family and um, through with other young people, then that gives you the authority to speak as far as I'm concerned, and that's, and always check in, you know, don't try not to get too big headed about it and then run off and, and leave the elders stranded. You've got to keep checking in with your old people, which uh, I, I have to do that. And sometimes I get, you know, a little smack to say, you know, you can't do it that way. You've got to do it that way. And I don't mean literally smacked. I mean, you know, we know. Get, get told. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, I'm nearly 50 and my mum and my, my nan and my sisters still tell me and don't take it in a negative way. Take it in and learn from that. Well, I think the last um, question that I'll ask you, which is one that really this program talks about is Yinja Mara. Um, what's your message for respect and respect of culture and, and the first peoples, the first Australians, what would you say? Well, I'd have to say um, what my grandmother Edna Brown said to me, and that is never forget where you come from and always be true to yourself and your people and always, always respect your elders. Um, that, that's fundamental, you know. Our, our laws of the, la the law of the land is what should be guiding us. And that includes our old people and it includes looking after our land and water. We have to be guided by that first and foremost. Yes, we can learn the white man's ways, but we can never, ever give up our old ways because that's what's going to get us through at the end of the day. Thank you for that powerful message. Mandanguwu, and we look forward to a very, very bright future for you. All I can say is thank you. Stay black and deadly, you mob out there. And please, if you ever want to have a yarn, I'm here. Marambangbalang. Marambangbalang. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. That means deadly. <laughs> ah, there you go. Wonderful. And I think I said it all right.